It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing messages of hope around the world. The humpback whale is one of the most majestic creatures on all the earth. It is massive in size and amazing in its beauty. It is almost unimaginable that an animal that is 16 meters long, weighing over 30 tons, can breach the water fully in display of its magnificent power. This mammal has a heart that weighs around 200 kilograms and eats during the feeding season 2,000 to 2,500 kilograms of plankton, krill, and other small fish every day. You can find whale watching tours all over the world. The northeast and west coasts of Canada offer ample opportunity to see these grand creatures. On December the 3rd, 2012, Captain Jerry Smith of Aqua Ventures Dive Center in Baltimore, West Cork, Ireland, led a group of people on a tour to see this king of the sea. They were aboard the Wave Chieftain, pursuing a humpback whale. As the boat stopped, all the people were directed to look to the starboard side of the ship. They looked intently, waiting for the telltale signs that they were in the right area. They gazed, looking for the footprint left by the whale, waiting for the whale to surface. But then, in the now famous picture, by photographer Simon Duggan, he captured a humpback whale breaching. But everyone on the wave chieftain with their backs to the action. They were in the right place, but looking the wrong way. They looked on the wrong side of the boat. Friends, as we watch for Jesus in his soon return, are we watching in the right direction? Do we know how Jesus will return? Or are we looking in all the wrong places? Throughout history, civilizations have been concerned with immortality. Each culture seemed to have a quest for immortality. In ancient Egypt, the pyramids were built to immortalize the Pharaoh's pursuit of immortality. The ancient Babylonians sought after immortality. The Romans sought for immortality. The Incans and Mayans and their great pyramids were building quests for immortality. This shouldn't come as a surprise to us because the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11, also, he has put eternity in their hearts. Man was made with a natural desire to live forever. However, Throughout the course of history, mankind has looked in all the wrong places. Even today, there are some Christians looking in the wrong direction. Today, we will study the manner in which Jesus will return. In the last two weeks, we have discussed what signs you need to watch for. If you've missed those programs, you can log on to our website at itiswrittencanada.ca to watch the programs you've missed. To begin with for our study today, we will look at a descriptive passage in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54. The Bible promises, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. This passage says that the corruptible will put on incorruption. Literally in the original Greek, this word means perishable. We use this often in the context of food, perishable and non-perishable food. Perishable food is that food which can spoil easily. 
Non-perishable foods are those foods that are canned and packaged and will seemingly last forever. Right now, you and I are perishable goods. It may be a bit of a morbid thought, but as soon as we are born, we begin to die because we're perishable. This corruptible, this perishable, this mortal will at that time when Jesus comes again, put on incorruption and put on immortality. That immortality, which from ancient times, civilizations have been striving to achieve, will be ours. Jesus is coming again to set up a kingdom of imperishable goods. He created us originally to last forever. But because of sin, we are bound by its consequence of death. But Jesus died to free us from that consequence. And when he comes again, that will be fully realized in his kingdom and his people which will last forever. After that twinkling of an eye, after that last trumpet, after we have put on immortality, then what? We will get to see for ourselves what Jesus really meant when he said in John 14, 2 and 3. John 14, 2 and 3. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus has prepared a wonderful place for us. And it is described by the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. Revelation 21, 18 to 21 John describes this remarkable city in heaven where we will go and live. The construction of its wall was as of jasper and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. And then John tells us that there are 12 foundations of the city, each of them made up of a different type of precious stone. And he goes on to say in verse 21, The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. It will be a place of unparalleled beauty. This city and its inhabitants will last forever. God has revealed this thrilling end time plan in his word. And he wants us to be watching in the right direction. He doesn't want us to miss this beautiful and peaceful place. Jesus desires that we would see with clear eyes and not be deceived. So let's go to the Bible with the eyes of our hearts and our minds open and discover how this will take place. So how then will Christ return and take us to that most magnificent city described in Revelation 21? First, it will be a literal event. Luke 17 and verse 24 describes Jesus' second coming. Luke 17 and verse 24. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. The coming of Jesus is described as lightning. Lightning is real. It flashes and it streaks across the sky and people see it. It can be so bright that you can see it even with your eyes closed. In the book of Acts, the second coming is described in a bit more detail. The book of Acts, chapter one, verses nine through 11. Now when he, speaking of Jesus, had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus did not vanish from them, but he ascended to heaven. The disciples saw him with their own eyes. When two heavenly beings taught them that the second coming of Jesus will resemble his ascension to heaven. 
a real Jesus ascended to heaven and a real Jesus Christ will descend at his second coming. Some have talked of Jesus' second coming merely being a spiritual coming. The Bible teaches that a real Jesus literally ascended up into heaven and that a real Jesus will literally descend from heaven through the atmosphere to this very planet we call home. Just as Jesus' coming will be a literal event, it will also be a visible event. John described this visible event in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. The passage clearly states that every eye will see him. His coming will not just be seen by believers, but all the inhabitants of the earth will observe his coming. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 30. Matthew chapter 24 and in verse 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. All the tribes of the earth is a description of the entire population. Everyone will see the coming of Jesus because it is a literal and a visible event. But his coming will also be an audible event. The Apostle Paul outlined the second coming of Jesus in his first letter to the Thessalonians in chapter 4 and verse 16 and 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Paul here continues the theme of a literal and visible event, but he supplies the addition of an audible event. The voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God are not silent mediums of sound. This sound will reverberate all through the earth. The first passage we looked at today in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, also emphasizes the audible nature of Christ's return. 1 Corinthians 15 and 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. God's trumpet will sound. I don't think that can be any kind of silent trumpet. That mighty sound will raise the dead from their sleep and slumber. Christ's coming will be a literal event. It will be a visible event and it will be an audible event. And his coming will most certainly be a glorious event. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 27 Matthew chapter 16 and verse 27. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his own work. In Revelation 19, Jesus described his glorious appearance at the second coming. Revelation chapter 19. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen and white and clean, followed him on white horses. There is a real Christ coming in the sky and a real Christ who is coming to resurrect the dead. It will be a glorious event. I know someone who is moving to a new area and one of the homes they were considering sat directly across from a cemetery. The children didn't like the idea of living across from a cemetery. 
In an attempt to convince his children about this house, he said, kids, when Jesus comes again, you will have front row seats. What will that day be like when Jesus comes to reunite families? Have you lost loved ones? Have you lost your parents? Maybe a spouse, possibly a son or daughter. Perhaps you've lost a little baby. Jesus is literally coming. He is visibly coming. His coming will be audible, so everyone will hear him, and he is coming in glory to reunite you with those loved ones that put their trust and hope in Jesus. Why not put your trust fully in him today? Jesus' second coming will also be a climactic event. Jesus promises to us in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12, and behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. The second coming rewards each individual for the life they lived. In it is the climax of human history. Some groups will be thrilled by his return but others will not. Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6 describes that group in verse 15. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? Who is able to stand? No one need be a part of the group that trembles at the coming of Christ. Jesus has made the provision for us to be able to stand. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 24 tells us, By faith you stand. We stand by faith, but faith in what? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 gives us the answer. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We are able to stand by faith in the grace of Christ. We must stop trusting in ourselves and trust fully in Jesus. He has made a way for us. Jesus is on our side. He is not out to get us. He wants to receive us. Jesus is coming to take us to be with him. And when he comes, it will be a literal, It will be a visible, it will be an audible, it will be a glorious, and it will be a climactic event. But some might be wondering right now about the secret rapture and how that fits into all of this. Some have said that the Bible depicts Jesus is coming as a thief in secret, citing Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And in verse 43, he goes on. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. However, these texts do not seem to be describing the manner being secretive. These texts are referring to time as is evidenced by the usage of the words day and hour. The timing of Jesus' return will be a secret, but not the way in which he comes. Matthew 24, 44 adds clarification when it says this, Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Clearly, this is a reference to timing, not manner. Please notice another reference to Jesus' coming as a thief in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, where it says, 
But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Did you hear that? In the same verse that describes Jesus coming as a thief, in that same context, it says there's a great noise and fire. Both of those audible and visible attributes. The second coming is a surprise for those that are unprepared. Often those who believe the secret rapture teach that the church will be raptured or removed before the tribulation. However, Revelation 16, 15 again describes Jesus' second coming as a thief after the first six plagues or tribulation. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and see his shame. Jesus' coming as a thief surprises those who have not daily prepared for that day. But some ask, what about the expression one taken and the other left? Well, let's look at that passage in Luke 17 and verse 36. Luke 17 and verse 36. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken and the other left. But let's remember the context. In just a few verses previous to this, Jesus said in Luke 26 and 28, And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. Was the flood of Noah's day a secret? How about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? No, each of these communities were thoroughly warned and the events were literal, visible, audible, and climactic events in nature. The issue of one taken and one left lets us know that before the coming of Jesus, there will only be two classes of people, one saved, one lost. There is no additional chance. Right now, we are living in the time to decide. There is no second opportunity. The time to get serious is now. Paul admonishes us in 2 Corinthians 6.2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Our eternal destiny is being settled by the choices we make today. Christ's coming will be a literal event, a visible event, an audible event, a glorious event, and a climactic event. Equally important, the second coming of Jesus will be a joyous event. Paul's encouraging words in Titus 2.13. Titus chapter 2 and in verse 13. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The second coming of Jesus is the only really hope that we have in this hopeless and helpless world. His second coming will make us new. It will reunite us with long lost family members and we will be able to cry out those words of Isaiah chapter 25 and verse nine. It will be said in that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. My dear friends, Jesus desires you as a friend. He wants you to be in his kingdom. He is coming again to take you home. He has made every provision possible for you to be there. He wants you to be there. He has given us signs of his return. And he has told us how he will return. Today, won't you commit your life to him? Maybe you're sitting there at home watching on television. Maybe you're watching on your computer. 
and you've been moved by today's message. You are moved because you know that you have lived your life trying to do things your own way. Maybe you are sensing the call to come to Jesus. Maybe you're hurting because life has dealt you very difficult situations. Jesus is calling for you to come to him. In Zechariah 1.3, the Lord says, return to me and I will return to you. You haven't gone too far, friend. Jesus will accept you wherever you are. He's coming again and he brings hope for the future, but he also brings hope for today. Do you desire that hope? Do you want to be filled with that hope? Let's pray and ask the Lord to give us hope. Oh, dear Father in heaven, we know that Jesus is coming soon. The signs of the times point to his soon coming, but we also know the manner in which he will return. And we look for that visible and literal, that audible, that climactic, glorious and joyous event. We long to be reunited with our loved ones. We long to live in that peaceful, harmonious place. But today we invite you, Lord, into our hearts, that you would change us. We've struggled immensely. And now we know that we have hope in you, that you want to save us. Everything that could be done has been done to save us. And so today, we give our heart to you. Please, Lord, save us. Make us ready. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. You can find additional resources at our website, itiswrittencanada.ca. There you'll find our YouTube channel where all of our programs are archived. Or you can go to our Facebook page and like it or follow us on Twitter. I hope to see you again next week. Until then, remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God.